Welcome to Doc NYC Pro. My name is Eric Johnson. I'm the producer of Doc NYC Pro. It's our conference that runs for eight days uh, concurrently with the Doc NYC Film Festival. Uh, we have uh, over 60 panels, over 200 incredible panelists speaking on all nature of documentary uh, things. And this is part of our documentary series focus called, uh, called Series Focus. It's new to Doc NYC Pro this year. Uh, all day today we have uh, case studies like this one. We have in-depth uh, panel discussions. Uh, so definitely uh, check these out. If documentary series are your thing, this is the place to be all day today. And it runs through next Thursday, uh, the 15th of November. So first off, I'd like to thank our leadership sponsor, Netflix. Netflix has uh, you know, paved the way for all of this to happen, the entire festival. So thank you to Netflix for everything and making Doc NYC happen. Uh, our major sponsors are A&E &E Films, Amazon Studios, HBO Documentary Films, and History Films. Our supporting sponsors are Discovery, National Geographic Documentary Films, Showtime Documentary Films, and Topic Studios. Our leading media sponsors are New York Magazine and WNET. Uh, Doc NYC Pro is co-presented by major sponsor Amazon Studios. And our happy hour today is co-presented by Focus Features. So you are here, and you have chosen wisely to see a case study of making a murderer. And uh, we have uh, members of the creative team, as well as the creators of the series uh, here today, Moira Dimas and Laura Ricciardi. And uh, first off, though, I would like to introduce uh, our moderator. You're in excellent hands today, uh, Gita, Gan Gita Ganbir is a filmmaker who has been nominated for three Emmy Awards and has won two. Her work includes A Journey of a Thousand Miles, Peacekeepers, I Am Evidence, Armed with Faith, and the new series, Why We Hate. So please welcome Gita Ganbir. It's a very long walk. I know, it's a long walk. Thank you, Gita. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so we're so lucky today to have the creators of the, of the series and their team here. So I'd like to bring up um, Moira Dimas and Laura Ricciardi. Please come on up. And everyone, everyone else, come on up as well, please. We'll, uh, we'll get started. We should have probably been on the other side of the stage. <laughs> That's OK. So I'm going to start off by, um, as you can see, we're so fortunate to have the creative team here today. And I'd love to have the, our, our creators, um, who wear many, many hats uh, on this series, which is you know, part of the beauty of this. And the beauty and the pain of the show, obviously, is the, the wearing of many hats. But I'd love for them to, to start off by introducing the rest of the team. OK, so. First up here in the hat is Nelson Walker, one of our cinematographers, and he's a filmmaker himself and a cinematographer who's worked extensively in Congo and Tibet, and more recently in Manitowoc County. Peabody Award-winning filmmaker. Oh, <laughs> sorry, a little nervous here. Um, next up, we have Iris Ng, an amazing cinematographer who uh, shot Sarah Polly's story we tell, the award-winning documentary. And she also shot a film that's here at Doc NYC called Shirkers, which you should check out if you haven't seen it already. <laughs> Next up, uh, Fred Chang, who um, himself is also a filmmaker, but also a cinematographer and an editor, and worked with us as an editor. His first solo project was the amazing documentary Dior and I. Another film, if you haven't seen it. See it right now. And way over at the end is Leslie Schatz, who uh, is our sound designer, sound mixer. And he mixed his first documentary in 1971. And all you have to do is look up his filmography, and you will be in awe of Leslie. <laughs> Leslie's. <laughs> Leslie's an Academy Award winner and uh, Emmy, <laughs> Emmy nominee for season one of Making a Murderer. 
So as you can see, we have a, a really stellar team up here, and this is a this is a really big honor for me too. I'm I'm excited to be here with uh, with all of these folks from uh, from my community. But so I want to just really quickly read um, the synopsis, like a brief, you know, just sort of notes on what the series is about and you know I, i'm sure you all know much about it and how groundbreaking it was but um obviously these folks have been working on and the second season which is you know was it's, it's had its own set of challenges and that's really what we'll be talking about today but so just so you know to refresh everybody so making a murderer introduce the world to stephen avery and his nephew brendan dossie am i saying that right mm -hmm. brendan dossie two wisconsin men convicted of the, the brutal murder of photographer Teresa helbach right okay filmmakers and now I will say their names again. Filmmakers Laura Ricciardi and Moira D Dimas followed the twists and turns of this case for over a decade, documenting along the way the possibility of a massive miscarriage of justice. At the end of Making a Murderer's first 10 episodes, Stephen and Brendan had been sentenced to life in prison, but remained hopeful about the possibility of their eventual release. The new chapter of Making a Murderer complicates this narrative in unexpected ways and introduces crucial new characters. Stephen's story attracts the attention of Kathleen Zellner, a hard-charging Chicago-based lawyer who specializes in overturning wrongful convictions. She takes up Stephen's case and assembles a host of world-class experts who employ the latest scientific methods which raise serious questions about the forensic evidence used to convict Stephen over a decade ago. So an incredible feat, of course, to not only complete the first series, set of the series, and then embark on the second one. And I think really we have some clips to show you guys that will be uh, you know the topic of our discussion up here but really quickly i just want us to go over some of the th the things that were really important to you guys in the making of this series um there you know there were certain key key sort of decisions you had to make in the creative process can you to talk about that and obviously feel free to throw to the rest of your team sure i mean well one thing you mentioned was challenges for part two as i guess we're calling it um, with with part one, we had, um, you know, our major asset was time. It was, we worked independently for eight years, and um, so we didn't have a distributor at that time, and we were, you know, unknowns ourselves. The story wasn't very well known, and so we were able to, to take our time and really wanted to do the story justice. Um, with part two, um, you know, the story had become so high profile, and um, we knew that we were going to be documenting a changed world in part because of part one and the publicity that it generated and the talk on social media and the global response to the series. Um, so we felt we needed to be in production and post-production simultaneously, which, you know, for the filmmakers out there, I'm sure you understand that that's quite challenging, especially in long form, because, you know, on the one hand, we're documenting a story as it's unfolding. We have no idea where it's going to go, um, what the characters are going to do, what they, what they will experience, what obstacles they'll run into. And um, so we're filming all of that and then, you know, bringing the material in and, um, you know, when you're working in post-production, ideally you have some distance from the material to process it and have some perspective on it. And that helps you structure the story and, and all of that. So that was, that was the biggest difference between part one and part two for us. Yeah, and I, I mean, certainly as a storyteller, it's, it's useful to know the end of the story when you're <laughs> writing and editing the beginning. So there was a lot of back and forth and interplay between production and post, and it was very fluid as we went. Um, you know, when we started out, you know, we were making episode 11, and suddenly there's 201 through 210. So <laughs> it was a, it was a long process, and we'll talk more about that as we look at some clips. Um, the other, you know, the other main difference was we had a partner in Netflix from day one, and so though we knew we weren't going to have the asset of time, um, which for artists out there that really is just about the number one asset there is. But you know, if you can't have time, it's great to have some financial support, and um, which allowed us to bring on our amazing team. And, but you know, that's a process, because this was, you know, we're calling it part two, but it's a second season 
uh, of a show, a show that's already established a language, already established a style, and all of those things that you know we carefully crafted, we had to, you know, there was a process of bringing on each team member, whether that be introducing Nelson and Iris to Dolores Avery and Alan Avery and allowing that intimacy to be developed with new people. Um, or, you know, working with Fred, one of our editors, about, you know, how it is we're going to structure it, what we want out of our scenes. And um, so, you know, the exciting opportunity to grow the team and then the process of, you know, Laura and myself not just having the 10 episodes in mind, um, but also the 20 episodes in mind and able to get out the best from each of our team members. Okay, I think that's great. I think we'll dive right into to seeing some of the clips because I think we can talk about the work in the context of them. So if we could cue up clip one, please, which is from episode one. I'll say that this to me was always an incredibly uh, powerful, disturbing, you know, complicated and emotional scene because, you know, through the process of this experiment, you know, this experiment which seems to be um, you know, being, it's being done in sort of a, a very calculated way and everyone, although they seem quite professional and removed emotionally for the viewer, what's revealed through the experiment is terrible, a terrible and kind of disturbing and, and heartbreaking. So, there's, and there's a couple of questions I have, have here. First, I think for you guys about style and, and the, sort of your decisions around you know, the, the vision for this scene as far as style, and then I'd like to turn to the DPs to talk about how you accomplish that with multiple cameras, et cetera. So can you guys start out with a little bit about style? Moira, you edited this in so many ways. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is one of the first experiments that we see Kathleen do, and, you know, it's an interesting thing throughout the whole series to, you know, what we're doing, it's interesting today to talk about our process, because what we, do for a living is basically document other people's process. But, you know, so we're on this journey with her and, you know, so trying to document an experiment where we know, we know the setup, you know, we know that what we're going to be looking for is what ends up there on the cargo door. But, you know, we have no idea all the steps is going to happen. So it's like about trying to use what you, what you know in advance to make smart choices to be prepared for what might happen. Um, and we know that you know one of the themes of the series is going to be about you know the the pain involved in doing all of this in post conviction in general you know and pain on all sides and you know the trauma of asking these questions or doing these experiments which you know to some may seem insensitive um, but when it comes down to it you know her scientific approach of if this is what Kratz is saying happened to her, I need to test that. Because if, if I can't replicate that that's how the blood got there, then something else happened to her. And it's actually, you know, an action of respect to try to ask those questions. And, you know, this is episode one. So, you know, you may be uncomfortable with it. You may not think that that's why she's doing it. But, you know, it's a process. And, you know, your feelings might change as you watch more of what she does and more of what inspires her and more of how people respond to her. So, you know, we're always interested in just sort of trying to place the viewer right there and not tell them how to feel about it, but let them have a million different reactions to it and then maybe by episode seven feel differently about how they felt in episode one. And that journey is what we're very interested in. And, and I think, um, I mean, that's, that's so well put. And I think just what was so incredible in the shooting is the intimacy that you really feel in that scene. It is, it's shot in a way that you do feel that you are there. So could I, could I turn to uh, Iris and Nelson? I'd love to talk to you guys about the process of shooting this. Um, well, I guess um, with this being an experiment, there are things that we, we understand going into it um, in terms of a situation, but we don't know the outcome or how people are going to move and that's the the most challenging thing is assigning sort of priorities for Nelson and I when we're shooting two cameras um, we being people who are used to to working alone as camera people and and now just now having this collaboration where we are trying to be equals and and 
um, sort of help each other and help each other get each other's shot. So I guess there's that discussion of, of the verite where to be. Um, but there's also the sort of setting up of the parameters of like how do we light this and how do we make sure that we're going to see that piece of paper in the end and um, where should we place the Rev4? Like we have those kinds of options and we can work within what we know to, to sort of play within that, within that space. And that's sort of the exciting part is, is when it actually happens after we set everything up, just going with it and maybe all of our priorities go out the window because <laughs> I was supposed to follow Kathleen and you're supposed to follow Stuart. Um, and, and when we do that dance, you know, how that sort of pans out and it has to do with just knowing each other's eye contact and awareness and physicality, but also um, something that we did have also was, was um, walkies where Moira and Laura were looking at monitors um, and seeing what we were shooting. So, I mean, we, we can only know so much about what the other is shooting and what we're getting in terms of whether it's single or a, a dirty over or, you know, a wide. Um, and it was just good to have both of those in place to, to get what was needed to, to understand what was happening and to access the information that was necessary for that scene. That's, that's great. And Nelson, can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of, the, the, you, you mentioned control, what you have control of and what you don't, and like how you handle boundaries in a situation like that? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, this was my first time ever shooting. Uh, I'd shot in two camera situations before, but this was really my first time shooting in you know a whole sort of film mm -hmm. uh, with two cameras, and it it was really interesting in that when you're shooting as a single single camera operator, you can kind of uh, follow the path that uh, what's happening takes you on, and and do so without uh, a huge amount of restrictions. But when there's another camera there. Uh, it it changes things, and you have to be aware of where the other camera is, and um, both in terms of your position and how it how it's potentially cutting together, but then also so that to make sure that you're not getting in the other person's shot. And you know, what to me was really interesting about shooting two cameras is that uh, it actually opened up spaces as a camera person that I normally wouldn't even think about, um, in a sense, because I knew, you know, Iris was say covering. Kathleen, uh, it allowed me to focus more and, and look deeper into uh, people's reactions or into these spaces that you normally wouldn't have access to. And I think that speaks to what you mentioned about some of the intimacy of the scene is that, you know, we could, it, it wasn't just a matter of covering things. It was actually about being with the other people um, in a way. And that to me was really exciting. And it was, I think it was beautifully done. You know, there was, it was really, and I think this is something throughout the, the series that we see is like the intimacy that you guys the really bring the viewer in in a way that you feel that you are there, you know, and that's very powerful. One thing I would just add to Nelson, this idea of like being with the other people, being with the people that are witnessing a scene or listening, because we had, because Kathleen works with these experts, there were so many times where, you know, she herself sort of became the proxy for the viewer because she's learning something from an expert or in this scene, you know, she's presenting to Stuart James because he needs to know really how it's set up. And so the viewer can kind of identify, you know, go around the room and be identifying with different people, which allows a really immersive experience. And I, I just wanted to touch upon our team building as well because, um, you know, we haven't yet mentioned that Iris was an integral part of part one. Um, she joined us, I think, in what, the winter of 2013? She joined us for very cold winters yeah. in Wisconsin. Um, <laughs> yeah, we did 11 days of winter exteriors because yeah. we realized we had four episodes that took place in the winter and we had been in the courtroom the whole time. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we learned what the exterior. word polar vortex was. <laughs> yes. Polar vortex. Yes, it was. Yeah. And, you know, Moira and I, I remember in LA, we went to see stories we tell and we were blown away. And we thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing? if we could get Iris Ng to, to work with us. And we couldn't believe that she, you know, re, she responded to us, let alone agreed to work with us. So we were thrilled. <laughs> of course. And, um, and, and Nelson, both Nelson and Fred, we went to graduate film school with. So we go way back. And Nelson shot a beautiful film called Summer Pasture um, that he made with his wife, 
Lynn True, who, is she Walker now? I don't know. Okay, Lynn True, <laughs> uh, who's an editor. And so, you know, we knew the sensibilities of, of Iris and Nelson and really thought if we could have the two of them work as a duo, that would be an amazing collaboration. And so I just wanted to mention that because I'm, I'm very proud of them and, and I think it worked out very well and we're s extremely grateful to them. No, it's, it's clearly worked out and is working, continues to work out. So, so uh, I think on that, we should go to the next clip, if we can. So clip two, um, which is from episode four, and we get to see more of this work. Okay, so this is, again, another very intimate scene, introducing a character who um, then, and, and some really interesting choices in there that, uh, who basically a character who ultimately breaks the fourth wall. And, and, and you guys made an editorial choice to leave that in, you know, which speaks volumes to her about her and who she is. So I found that all really fascinating. Can you talk a little bit about the process of shooting this scene, of, of, or directing this scene, and then we can lean over to the rest of the team? This was actually a scene that we, <laughs> I guess, directed remotely, I'd say. <laughs> we were in LA, actually, and Nelson was able to fly out. I can't remember the sense of urgency. I don't know if we didn't have very much notice about the yeah, date of her visit. Yeah, it was very, it was very quick. Um, okay. And so um, we had a call with Nelson. We, Moira and I prepared questions for Lynn for the drive over. Um, talked about, you know, Moira talked about the coverage she'd be interested in getting for the scene and then, you know, Nelson just did his magic and I think he can talk about actually being with Lynn and, and shooting that, and Fred, of course, edited the scene, so Fred can pick up from there. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you, Fred. <laughs> you can start. Um, I mean, like Laura said, uh, the this shoot happened really quickly, and I, I, I went into it without any sort of, any real information or knowledge of who Lynn was, and I think that was really helpful in a way, because I, as a shooter, I wasn't really judging her or had any sort of, I didn't come with any uh, kind of preconceived notions about who she was or what she might be in it for. And it was an instance where, you know, it was very interesting filming because she was ob she obviously uh, wanted to be a part of the series, as she says in the, um, in the clip you just saw. Uh, and she was uh, hyper aware of, of the camera. And when we first met, she, you know, kept asking, um, you know, what to do, where she should stand, what she should, you know, it was, she was almost, she was like looking for direction in a way. And um, I was just very clear that, you know, there, you just have to do what you're going to do and I'll, I'll just kind of hang with you. And even to that regard, you know, th there was a whole list of questions that I had, but what you see in the car is really not generated out of the, that list of questions. It was more just giving her the space to uh, speak uh, you know, I, I maybe asked one question that prompted it and then stayed largely silent. And there was, you know, this internal monologue that was going on in her head that she just sort of spilled out in front of the camera uh, that, you know, I just felt very lucky to be there to, to capture. But obviously she was comfortable enough to, to do that. I think sometimes there is, I think what you see in this scene is the art of, of giving a character the space and not over directing so that ultimately she revealed what was going on inside of her mind without you having to drag it out of her necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I think that in, in part that's related because like I said before, she was asking for direction. She had a, she kind of had this, she had an expectation, I think, of what the film would be or what the, what the process would be that somehow we would be, you know, constructing things or, or, you know, directing her or putting her in a place. And when, um, I pretty immediately just said that's not the way that we work and not what we're we're doing. It um, again, it just sort of like freed freed her up in a way to uh, to to just be herself. Mm -hmm. That's good. And so, can you talk about the process of editing this? Um, sure. The, this is still like one of my favorite scenes in, in, that I got to edit on on part two um, because, and it still breaks my heart to sing it again. Just the um, the complexity of uh, introducing this new character that, and and as you know they've said before like trying not to judge her but really have having empathy for what she's trying to do 
and following in the footsteps of Nelson, I mean, Nelson's vibe is very, as you could tell, like very, very open, and uh, and you could tell that from the footage. <clears throat> the footage was the, she really sort of revealed in in that drive um, a little bit of who she was, and then I have like a minute or two to sort of show that and 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 edit it in a way that is compelling for the film. And I think one of the things that we talked about with Laura and Moira early on is. Um, um, you know, obviously, season uh, season one, part one, had been so important that there was no denying that the the um, the, the level of media attention on the series was play, sort of playing a factor. You know, playing playing a part in part two, and uh, they opened the season, the new the the new season with a montage of of that media attention. So, for me, it was very interesting to sort of reflect that in the scene because um, obviously she reveals that you know that was part of her decision to sort of connect with Stephen Avery and, and and then the challenge becomes to do justice to to Lynn but do justice to Stephen as well and how do you explain the different uh, the complexity of feelings that everyone brings into this this case um, and you know, it was it was a uh, something that I tried. I tried many different ways. You know, um, as Nelson said, uh, Lynn was very self-conscious, so she would acknowledge the camera a lot, and that and part part parts of that were in the cut in the beginning. But then, I I, I felt like that line that she says at the end, right before she goes off, was so powerful that that said everything that she didn't really need to engage the, ca the camera beforehand. And actually, it was more interesting to, for her to, uh, uh, to explain where she came from emotionally so that she had a chance to really, uh, because I have tremendous empathy for what she's going through. I think I wanted to give that a chance in the scene before we reveal that maybe there's another layer on top of that that has to do with you know, media and everything. So that that was the challenge. Yeah. No, I, th I think that was you know it's a very brave thing to do to again the the choice of having her address the documentary and address the fact that she was motivated you know by you know again she watched it and then was motivated possibly by some of the attention that she might get also and then this this incredible feeling that she was connected to Steve somehow. So um, so yeah, and it, it's again it's that choice is complicated, of course. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I'm a sound designer. So uh, you know, our challenge in sound and documentaries is to try and uh, engage the viewer and um, add a layer of polish without it being seeming like it's imposed. So there's a lot of little details in the sound throughout that uh, you know the challenge is to be as small as you can, not as big as you can, like in features. But in this particular scene, it's very interesting. I don't know if you. Uh, paid notice to the fact that uh, the guy wolf whistles at her at the end. Like, that's something I would never dare put in. Or I would be completely voted out. This was in the actual uh, shooting, so it was like a gift from heaven. But that's an example of the kind of thing where, you know, you have to be really careful and uh, add things that support the detail that seem believable and not things that a uh, viewer will watch and say, oh, yeah, that, that, that's phony. So. Just in case anybody was wondering, I didn't put that in. <laughs> <laughs> that There's other sounds I wanted to put in. We'll get to that later. But. <laughs> no, that wolf whistle really is. I mean, it, it adds so much, honestly. It adds so much that you guys left it in. It speaks so much to also somehow yeah. the attention that she gets and maybe, you know, wanted or unwanted, you know, mm -hmm. what she faces out in the world. But I, um, there's also a little bit more to the scene, which is interesting in the editing, which is the fact that essentially she is revealed, and then the protagonist speaks about her afterwards. So it's you know there's this this sort of in the editing we are learning more, right? We are sort of ahead of the protagonist in the edit. And was that a decision? Just briefly, if you could tell us. Well, I mean, I think uh, Stephen is such an old soul, and he always surprised me in the the the, the audio that I was given. And you know, you uh, when he says that she had a bad life and I have a bad life too. I mean, you really, f I believe him. I'm, I'm like he connected with this woman and he's totally with it. And that's, I mean, 
we, the viewer, know what she went into the prison thinking, you know, or telling us, but he doesn't know. So it becomes a mini tragedy, and it was really just uh, the elements were were so powerful that I just had to put them together, and somehow it sort of clicked. And then we talked about it, and we refined it over the month that I was editing. But you know, but the elements were just very, very powerful to begin with. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want. I mean, obviously, listening to Fred, you can see what a genius editor he is. And, you know, Fred was with us for about four months because um, he lives here in New York and we edit in LA, so we could only lure him out away from his life for so long. But, um, and he basically edited the first pass of what at the time we were calling episode 12. And what's amazing about the scenes that you did, Fred, is, you know, in the end they end up in maybe five different episodes, but the scenes are, there's very little change to those first passes and what what airs in the final in the final product. But um, you know, it sort of touches on the difference between working on a scene and then working on the series. And as we gathered material and cut these scenes and identified what they truly were about, then then the question is where they fit in the arc of the whole story and the different threads that are going on and you know, just that calculation of certain scenes were tied in time to something. So you had certain tent poles, but then, you know, Lynn has her own arc through the series. Steven has his arc. Um, scenes with Dolores, you know, making sure each one of those had a, had a different job. Um, so, you know, just the collaboration of discovering the gems and sharpening them. Um, and then, you know, giving us the privilege to, you know, place them to make the whole, make them support them with the whole. It was really great. Well, I mean, the, the, my job was to give them little gems to work with, but that, I, I never felt like I could have um, the overall, like, scope of the project like they do, because it's, it's just, what really struck me when I first started working is the amount of information is just so, I mean, it's crazy, and they have a complete mastery of like of all the different elements, and so I can give them um, little elements to play with. But then, it was really gratifying to feel like I was I I knew they had a clear vision and they had a direction, and they could guide me into like this is more or less what um, you know the arc of the season is going to be. But as Moira said, it started with just two episodes. And then, you know, by the time I left, it was maybe four. But then, well, the two episodes the, were four hours total. So yeah. we're like, oh, well, this is four episodes. <laughs> so it was really, yeah, it was really like six and now to it's eight like episodes. 10 hours, yeah. <laughs> but so I think what's so, what you guys have talked about very clearly here is sort of the, in editing a verite, what is technically a verite doc series, right? You end up figuring out each character's arc. Right, so you edit each character. Each character has their own arc, and you end up editing each, you know, each character, and then figuring out how to interweave them. So it's sort of like sounds like a key technique that you guys used. I do want to make sure we get through yeah, some yes, more of absolutely. these yeah. these amazing clips that you guys have. So, so we're gonna continue now, and we'll do clip three, which is from episode five. Okay, so here we have sort of a complicated, like again, all, all these scenes feel complicated to me because they're, and again, it is a complicated s story ultimately, right, over the course of many episodes. But um, this, this is sort of about, I, I see like the layering of multiple characters, and can you talk a little bit about the sort of the creation of this scene, and the, or the direction? Sure, I mean, as you said, this scene appears in episode five, mm -hmm. um, or another way to think of it, I guess, is episode 15. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in part two, we have, because we're following the same story as part one, we have the benefit of our viewers knowing the characters. Um, there's still, obviously, more that they can learn about the characters and see characters in new situations. Um, but, you know, one concern we had early on when we were in production was, the extent to which the characters were going to be interacting with one another. We thought, oh, we might really be shooting them um, in separation, not within the same scene, but in just, you know, they're each doing their own thing in life. And um, because, frankly, there wasn't much interaction in the beginning when we started shooting between, say, Barb and Mr. and Mrs. Avery, for instance. 
So we felt like, okay, you know, um, we have to be very attuned and very nimble so that if there's an opportunity where um, these two parallel storylines have an opportunity to intersect, we want to try to capture that. And, you know, some opportunities arose. Um, I mean, it's the same storyline. It's, it's Stephen's storyline, but it's, you know, the working the case and the emotional or more character driven. So if Kathleen was going to the yard, um, we knew she would stop in and see Mrs. Avery, and we wanted to be there for that. Um, in this particular scene or sequence, um, what we wanted to do was try to accomplish through the edit the intersection of the storylines. And so in, in what you see here, you know, um, through the editorial process, um, we, were, we were filming on the same day in different locations. So I believe it was Moira and Nelson at Mr. and Mrs. Avery's, and I was with another camera person down in Chicago with Laura and Steve. Because of course, when there was breaking news, we wanted to try to cover the response of as many of our characters as we could. So, um, you know, we start with Laura and Steve here. Laura is leaving the building dejected after um, this defeat. And, you know, then of course, we want to check in with the family and ultimately with Stephen and see how they're all doing. So, um, you know, that was, that was one way to, to try to um, bring the characters together. And of course, you have, um, you know, Mrs. Avery expressing empathy and concern for Barb, because she's saying, you know, Barb was expecting Brendan to get out. I mean, the federal judge had ordered his release. She had no idea that this emergency motion was going to happen and ultimately block his release. So she had asked her boss for a month off of work because her son has been in prison for a decade. So she wanted to be there to help him re-enter society. And, you know, she works a factory job. It's low pay. And, you know, as Mrs. Avery says, she has a thousand dollar house payment. Now what is she going to do? So Mrs. Avery's expressing empathy for Barb even though Barb's not there. Um, and then we hear from Stephen. Stephen is expressing empathy for Brendan. You know, we're watching Mrs. Avery watch television and, you know, seeing her son in a perp walk or being talked about as, you know, and her grandson. Um, so anyway, that we felt like there was a richness there and, and we could, you know, tease out some of the layers of the story in this particular mm -hmm. way. Yeah, I think it was powerful. And then it also really, I think what you see too in this scene is, I mean, the time that you've had with these characters has allowed you to build a trust. Am I right? I mean, that is a huge factor in getting some of the intimacy that we see. Yeah, I mean, we've been shooting with this family for, at this point, 13 years. Um, at that point, maybe 11 or 12. But, you know, it also speaks to, this was about a year into our filming. And so, you know, I was up there with Nelson. The two of us were shooting. But, you know, by then, Nelson, you also had a relationship with Alan and with Dolores. And, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about that moment where Alan's yelling about the camera. But <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, first off, Alan is just such a, he's a, a lovely guy, and we had actually filmed with him, and he's just a real, he, you know, he, gr he grumbles a lot, so, you know, we, we had been filming him in the shop, um, uh, you know, on an earlier shoot, and he was just sort of, like, grumbling, and he'd be, like, swearing about trying to, like, get a piece of metal off of something he was trying to salvage, and so in that moment when he said, you know, get the camera off of me, um, you know, I, I, I knew that it just sort of that was sort of his character in a way to to be grumbling and a little bit and and obviously it's an intense time that they're in and given the uh, the the trust that had been built over the years even though he says get the camera off off of me the i i knew that it it didn't actually mean get the camera off of me um and if he had really meant get the camera off of me then there would be he would say it again or make it or 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 do it in a way that signaled that in a different way and i think you know, and, and actually, it becomes a really revealing moment because it actually, you know, it reveals, I think, the the pressure that the family is under and sort of the the way their lives have been uh, opened up uh, to to the public. And so, yeah, I mean, just as oftentimes, I, as a I, I do a lot of verite shooting, and uh, usually when somebody tells you to turn the camera off, that's precisely when you should be rolling, and then you sort of sort and, and not in a way that. Um, you know, you don't, obviously you don't want to 
put people in positions where you know, you're getting things that they really don't want. But um, usually in, in a moment like that, it speaks to a greater truth about the, mo the moment that's happening and it's something that's important to capture. So on that note, I, I mean, that's great and super important. I think so revelatory to the whole series, this technique that you guys have all used. Um, I think we basically have time for one more clip, which yeah. we should we do the Let's last do the one. Okay, so we'd like yeah, to do, so, so that's, that's the next one. You can do that too. You want to do that? Back to I back. Think, sure, well, just five. It depends on how much time we have. We have. If if you think we have, we have time, let's do it. Let's do them back to back. Okay. Both of those are really interesting and and kind of and they have their own technique to them. I'd like to qu very quickly just have you guys set up the first clip, and then I'd like to throw it to Leslie so that Leslie can tell us about the sound design in that. Can you just talk a little bit about having you know obviously that first scene was a big moment, multiple cameras. Just talk about that a little bit, and then we'll go to Leslie. Sure. Um, so as Laura mentioned earlier, you know, we had this fear that we weren't going to have this opportunity to have characters come together. Um, and this was actually one of the only times in the series that happened. These are oral arguments in Chicago in Brendan's case. And, you know, an example of where, you know, having the financial support of Netflix allowed us creative choices we just wouldn't otherwise have. So I think we had five or six camera teams with sound, many of them with sound partners that day, um, it was you know quite a logistical orchestration. Um, you know, as we had somebody on a roof to get dawn to get people. We had you know people with specific assignments. We had a Facebook with all the main characters and PAs at every corner, blocks away, so we could get a heads up. You know, we didn't know who was coming when, what direction they were coming from. Um, we knew we had to introduce Luke Berg um, from the Solicitor General's office. We had to set up the event that was going to happen. Um, so, you know, it was, I think we were 28 people or something on walkie, everybody, you know, eyes and ears out there. Um, and, you know, we got everything we needed for the day. So it was pretty successful. But then, you know, we put it all together and, you know, edit. But then it's when we bring it to Leslie in the mix that the world really comes alive and, you know, I, I'd love for you to talk about the work you did on this scene. Well, you know, as I said before, my job is to enhance what's there. And when I get the episodes, they I don't know any of this backstory of what it went, uh, what went into making it. But when I saw this scene, I was just on the edge of my chair. I thought this is just fantastic. It's like High Noon. Uh, or uh, Goodfellas, you know, I mean, I think in terms of theatrical movie references, because that's what I do mostly, and uh, I thought, like, wow, we, we've, got, we've got to, like, really make sure to bring that out as much as possible, which was already there. And with all the different sound elements of the, uh, the L train and the footsteps and the people walking on the bridge and the car horns, the um, revolving door, uh, the... Um, antenna going up, and there were so many great cutting points that uh, were used that sound was able to key into and try to orchestrate that feeling of tension and meeting and coming together of the opposite sides uh, and the rising and falling. And, you know, I'm, I'm not mentioning the music, but uh, I should because it's obviously an integral part also because the music ha had several different beats that it addressed. And the composers uh, throughout did an amazing job with uh, a difficult job of uh, continuing uh, to underscore the theme uh, many hours of music without it being tiring or repetitive because they, they operated with a wide palette of instrumentation. And that was obvious in, um, in these cues uh, between the plucked guitar and uh, the low strings and the other uh, elements that they use. But anyway, I feel it all came together uh, like an orchestra, and Maura and Laura were the concert masters at the end where we were able to just take the elements and manipulate them to success. No, it certainly did. It really all came together in an incredible way. And, um, and I think the music throughout is really powerful. Um, the one, the, and then the, the, for the very last clip, I'd just like you guys to, to say 
to talk about that a little. What's incredible about it, you know, we'll do it very fast because we need to open up. But the um, but what was incredible about it is it is a true verite scene. There is no you know vo. There is no interview interspersed. You're just with the character on this. You know what could otherwise have looked very simple. You know this is sort of going into you know offs, but it has so much tension and poignancy. So what plays um, in the series immediately before Kathleen's filing is um, you know preparation scenes or preparatory scenes. So um, there's a there's a non dialogue scene where two of her clerks are walking down the hall. They enter the conference room. The conference room is covered in papers. Everybody's sort of leafing through stuff, you know, doing finishing touches on the petition. And, you know, we tried to set up early on in part two um, the significance of the petition. And in fact, you know, this is a, that scene appears in, in episode seven. And so, you know, our viewers hopefully understand the significance of the petition at that point and, and what it means for Stephen. Um, it's essentially his lifeline. And so, um, Iris was there shooting. She was a primary shooter of that scene. You know, did the drive up with Kathleen, and you know, direction we gave to Iris. Part of it was about, you know, please be sure to shoot the petition itself, which is, you know, as you can see, voluminous. It's been reported to be, you know, 1,272 pages. It's five volumes. <laughs> Um, to treat that as, you know, a character in the scene. And one of the things we talked about is that, you know, the scene, you could sort of use the metaphor of Kathleen as, you know, a surgeon flying in with an organ. You know, this is like the organ transplant that's about to happen. And so we need, you know, we need good shots of the organ. So, but um, <laughs> maybe, I mean, poor Iris, it was, you know, certainly a challenging scene in many ways. I mean, aside from that, I think... I mean, aside from the concentrating on different elements, it, I think you're always oscillating between the subjective point of view and, and the objective. And so I wasn't the only one, obviously, on, on this shoot. And Eric and I think um, Joel, Joel yeah. were, were on the ground as well. And so I was in the car with Kathleen. And so I'm, I'm sort of with her a lot of the time. And I'm capturing her perspective. But then you know, we also have to see this, this objective point of view, which is the car itself, and how that relates to the surroundings and, and what it means in terms of entering this county and, and the contrast to, to her normal setting, I guess. Um, but I don't remember how we led into this, but just, just I just want to mention how challenging it is shooting just in those spaces, like the car itself is, you know, you don't have very much to work with angle-wise. Um, and also, just as it unfolds, it happens so quickly um, that that was one of the, the times that almost everything went out the window in terms of like, yes, I need to get the petition um, as a character. But getting into that little clerk's office, it's like where you barely have room to turn around, and you, there were two of us in there, and somehow getting two angles of, of the action was really kind of amazing. Like, I don't even know how we did that. <laughs> no, you guys, but I just want to. I, I want to say you guys pulled it off. Like, it, it's fairly seamless. You know, you don't mm -hmm. see the discomfort of the space, which is really yeah. powerful. <laughs> we are we are at a point where I think I have to open it up to questions. Or am, am I we can take and the mic is over here. So if, if anyone uh, from the audience would like to get up, you have to stand at the mic. <laughs> it's not a hand raising situation, but we'd love to hear questions. Hi guys. Um, first of all, amazing. Love the like, second season. Uh, my one question is in one of the last episodes, there's a kind of explosive phone call between Barb Taddock and Steven. Um, I first wanted to know how you got that phone call. Uh, and then secondly, how these things that happen um, affect your relationships with these people and including them in the documentary series going forward. Or if like what you know things you cover in the documentary how that sort of changes what you cover and who you're allowed to film and include. I'll take the first part. <laughs> okay. the, the first part is pretty simple, so I'll take that one. Um, so the, all of the prison phone calls are, recor are recorded by the prison itself. And um, Kathleen actually made that particular phone call part of one of her filings, so it became um, I mean, it already would be in the public domain as having been recorded at the prison, but then um, 
I believe. Uh, but then she, you know, made it part of her filing, so it was in the public domain. And then I guess you know, the second part of your question is, you know, it, it touches on really the complex part of what it is that we do. Um, and it is hard to navigate um, with subjects when you're, you're documenting something with such high stakes and something that's unfolding in real time. And really, you know, the way that we handle it that simplifies the complexity of it is to be very clear about our boundaries and very clear about you know what it is that we do so that in these complicated times when there's that call or when Kathleen is you know developing a case you know that points to one of Barb's other sons as a potential suspect you know that's not changing anything we do with Barb you know she knows that we follow we're following Kathleen's process and that we're not investigating that and we're documenting someone else. And it can be a rough time, but there's a consistency in what we do that, you know, we go in waves, but we're always there doing the same thing. So the editing in this has been amazing and I can't imagine what a, a feat it must be with all the archival. Um, so my question is, is it just you two editing? And if so, how is that? It must be a huge challenge directing and editing at the same time. Or do you have additional editors and basically the process of trying to do both at the same time? In part two, we had, um, we had more editors. Um, we had Brian Johnson as part of our team for a, f a fair amount. And I think he's credited on the first eight episodes, perhaps. Um, and we had um, Mona Davis, another New Yorker who we lured out for, maybe she was willing to come for six months? I don't know, you know, it's always, you know, that's the thing with long form, is trying to keep a team for the whole process is, is a tricky thing. Um, and Fred was with us for four months. So, you know, it was a collaboration of different people at different times on this one. In the, in the scene where the legal team was loading the documents into the trunk of the car, um, it seemed very fortuitous that they decided, eh, let's not take the lids, right? And I just was curious if that was really how it unplayed or, you know, it's always the tension with the documentarian, like, you mind taking the lids? You know, you don't want to do that. <laughs> just curious how that unfolded. I actually don't remember. I was surprised, too, when I saw that. I was like, that's kind of... <laughs> yeah. Now we see what's in the box, yeah. And, sorry? And, and now you see what's in the box. And yeah, so. we see what's in the box. But I was surprised that the, the lids were off, too, and I don't remember how they <laughs> entered. <laughs> but I, I think um, their, uh, Kathleen's driver, Eddie, must have taken them off. I don't think we, we said anything to that effect um, yeah. in terms of, like, let's see. Because I think seeing the boxes themselves would have been enough for me. Maybe um, Kathleen wanted proof that maybe. they had been packed correctly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's you know, definitely a controller. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dave Major. I'm a film art director and prop master, usually from the narrative feature world. A uh, little bit of experience in documentary, but it strikes me that two cameras uh, is probably a pretty unique approach to uh, docs for a lot of us. Um, other than your massive 28 crew day, I was wondering how many are on your core crew and in what roles? Um, well, <laughs> Iris and Nelson, um, you know, as much as they were available. I mean, Moira sort of alluded to the fact that, you know, we're hiring people who work freelance. So we're unfortunately having to share them with other projects, but they were kind enough to make this project very much a priority. Um, so I would say most of the sit downs, Iris and Nelson shot two cameras. So one was in a tighter shot, one was in a wider shot, um, which obviously gives us options in the edit. Um, and then for the verite scenes, many of them were shot to camera. Other times they were shot single camera. Um, but it was basically Iris and Nelson. Um, we had a, a dedicated AC. sound person. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Nope. One AC. No, go ahead, Iris. Right. One AC. A yeah. dedicated sound person. Um, a DMT. Yeah. Who yeah. was very much yeah. with us mm -hmm. um, the whole time. Clay. Clay. Yeah. One swing. Um, mm -hmm. Some PAs, like mm -hmm. it, that varied depending on the scope of what we were doing. But that, mm -hmm. I think that was w what I would call the core. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. sort of eight to 10 people. Yeah. Thanks. yeah. You mentioned Nick, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm just wondering what your relationship is with the Hallbach family and how that's changed maybe from season one to season two and mm -hmm. what that's been like. Unfortunately, we don't have a relationship with the Hallbach family. Um, you know, the, the background on it is we, we you know, first read about Stephen Avery in the New York Times. We chose his story because of his unique status as a DNA exoneree charged with a new crime. Um, you know, we weren't looking for a homicide case to document. Um, we started filming in December of 2005. I think waited, and our very first day of shooting actually was Stephen's preliminary hearing, which we show in part one in episode three. And that was a court date where the judge was going to decide whether there was enough evidence to hold Stephen over for trial. Um, and it was a very intense day. It was like standing room only in the courtroom. We saw the Hallbucks for the first time there. Mike Hallbuck gave a press conference. We filmed that. But we waited f quite a while to reach out to them just out of respect for the family. We thought this is already a circus and we don't want to add to their tragedy or their pain. Um, but we waited and wrote a letter to them and explained who we were, why we were motivated to tell this particular story, and invited them to participate. Um, we did the same with the prosecutor. We did the same with the woman who was attacked on the beach in 1985, Penny Burnson. And, you know, people obviously decided for themselves whether or not they wanted to participate. Um, Mike Hallbach. Uh, sat down with us for coffee, actually. That's how it sort of evolved. And, and he told us at that point that he was suspicious of our motives mm -hmm. and um, that they didn't care to speak with us. So we, of course, respected that. But we still wanted to find a way to include their point of view in the story. And we felt lucky that Mike was um, sort of a de facto spokesperson for the family and gave a number of press conferences. and. I think spoke, you know, um, very much from the heart, and we felt like we were capturing a, a true representation of what his family was experiencing and how they wanted to focus as much of all of this um, on, you know, celebrating the life that Teresa lived rather than, you know, the tragedy of their loss. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it was sort of the same for part two. I mean, we we reached out to them again, and um, they declined. So. But, you know, all of that said, I mean, you know, they, they, and we've said this before, I mean, they endured an unspeakable tragedy and our heart does break for them. And we really wanted to find a way to include Teresa in the story. And we were so grateful in part two that a friend who attended college with her decided to sit down with us. He shared archival material with us and it gave us an opportunity to show more of Teresa, because by all accounts, she was an amazing person. And, you know, um, we really wanted, um, you know, people talk about her getting lost in all of this, and that certainly was never our intention. Um, but, it, you know, as documentarians, you know, you can only work with the material you have. So, it, you know, we tried to do our due diligence and tried to get our hands on as much as we could of Teresa. Um, and you know we we hope that the series is not causing them any pain in any way, um, and we're you know we're just really sorry. But we do think there there really are no winners here. You know, there's pain on all sides of this, and that's you know a big part of of what we wanted to show. Thank you. And that was I mean that was a that was a really beautiful and you know. I think an important answer to, or, or I should say an important question and a very powerful answer. So thank you for that. And so on that note, we are out of time, but thank you all so much for being here and, and thank you all. And one last thing I do want to say that the, the creator shared with me is that it is 13 years. Mm -hmm. Today marks 13 years to the day that Steve, Stephen was arrested. So, and here we are. Uh, and so. That's that. Thank you so much for being here.